very happy to hear from David that um, you know uh, four of you David and Bob Thurman and Isa and Eve Eggman the four of you are going to be part of a very important you know discussion in San Francisco uh, entitled uh, learning from dying um, which will be attended by very important stakeholders from the palliative care uh, you know uh, community and uh, I know that uh, Bob Thurman you are on the road promoting your latest book Man of Peace which is really on the importance of His Holiness and his message of peace and uh, I've always uh, you know admired you Bob very deeply and also as a Tibetan and also a great admirer and student of the Dalai Lama been deeply grateful for what Bob you have done in terms of promoting His Holiness's message in the world and um, the importance of really uh, promoting the understanding that here is a man of peace particularly the teachings of His Holiness uh, right now is very important especially when our world seems to be becoming increasingly polarized and people uh, with a Kind of you know North Korean conflict and um, and and right now the whole political rhetoric and uh, atmosphere and culture in in the United States not being particularly very uh, conducive to peace I think you know reminding the people that there is an alternative voice that there is an alternative vision for human society that so that people don't lose hope that people keep their optimism and commitment and belief in peace is so important so Bob your touring uh, the states and promoting this book Man of Peace is something very important and I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you and also extend my greetings to all four of you Bob, David, Isa and Eve. Bye bye. I've known you since 2005 we were in Bhutan together and that's when I fell off the cliff climb back up and that's a whole other story um, but getting to know you has been an incredible pleasure and two of the greatest teachings I ever heard for you from you were things that Nana said so one of them was uh, and this will go into dependent origination which was um, you were saying that you came home from the university that you work at that we won't name here for the moment and you were pretty frustrated with the academic grind and the other teachers weren't doing their job and students were requesting things that you were a little put off by and you were just kind of she was in the kitchen and you were just kind of letting loose with some irritation mm -hmm. and she finally said no no she turned to you and said shut up Bob before you make us both angry <laughs> which is actually a great Buddhist teaching because we don't exist as an absolute self. Consider the Bob back then who didn't listen to her or she didn't speak up and he went on and on about irritation and she did get irritated and then they had a lousy dinner together. But instead, she spoke up, he heard her, that changed. So which, which was the real Bob? You want to talk about absolute self and relative self. The basic stuff. Uh, this is an important thing for women, I think. You know, and it relates to the great Shanti Deva. You know, the Dalai Lama's special lineage of you know his whole thing about my my religion is kindness. You know, and the open-heartedness is the solution for the world and a world peace to inner peace. All of that sort of thing. It comes through from the Bodhisattva Manjushri, which is the who's kind of like the angel of wisdom. And then through an Indian writer called Shantideva, especially, the, who changed his name to Shantideva, which means the god of peace, so that people would feel peaceful just hearing his name. You know. <laughs> Before that, he had a rather more rude name that he was given as a student, uh, which, uh, because he seemed to be a dropout student, people thought he was really ignorant, didn't know anything when he was in school, Shantideva. And they gave him a rather rude name of Busuku. It was called Busuku. He who eats, sleeps, and defecates, that was what they called Because <laughs> they thought that was all he did. Uh, anyway, his, this great teaching is the anger is a really bad thing for us and for the world. You know? And the root of anger is frustration. And uh, when you see something happening that you feel shouldn't be happening, or when something that you think should be happening is being blocked from happening, you feel frustrated. 
and then you nurse that frustration and it builds up and then you blow up, you know. Then because you feel that you can't do anything in your calm uh, mode, uh, the anger comes to you in your own voice and says, this is unacceptable and I can't do it, that's not terrible. And, and you, you can't resist it because it's your own voice in your own mind and, you, and then you blow up your temper. And, you know, women in our country are socialized to sort of be polite and don't speak up and you know, and men blab away and they often go down like one paragraph after another of stupid things, <laughs> stupid statements. And then the women like feel more and more frustrated as this idiotic blabbering goes on and then they blow up. So my wife is a master, I think, you know, of what I call creative and humorous rudeness and interrupts right away when she's still in a good mood. And then when you get interrupted like that, like, well, why don't you shut up before we're both pissed off? Then you kind of, it's all right because there's no heat in it. And then you, of course, you feel, if you're a man, you feel, well, how, how come I'm not being listened to? And I'm, you know, I'm interrupted, you know, because you know, we're socialized to think that we're dominant, you know, not realizing that we're actually the lesser half, you know. And often out to lunch, you know, and so, so that's the, that's the example you take. So in honor of that, that's good. But I don't even know what is the question. <laughs> I'm happy to honor my better half. We just celebrated our 50th anniversary this time, and we were this summer, and we were voted by all our mutual friends when we got together as the least likely to succeed, the ex monk and the ex model. And, the, and each one thought, like, the monk friends thought, what is he doing with the model? And the model friends thought, that guy has no style. Like, what is, <laughs> he has a shaved head and whatever. Anyway, so we made it for through 50 years, and I do miss her. She's, uh, she's in Woodstock in the Catskills, where we are. And, um, but she's taking care of things there. So, uh, but the question, I think, about absolute self, was that your question, and relative I, self? I, I think you answered the fourth part of it very well, the third and the second, the first parts. We'll, we'll, let's go on to Eve. Let's well, have okay. a new question. That was okay. good. Well, I could do something about absolute self. You all know, don't you, that there are 5,000 YouTube videos of Bob expounding on any of the th tidbits that you get here. Tonight will be tidbit night. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So... <laughs> As a better half, I can ask you a oh, different sure question. You sure. So I first actually just wanted to know how many healthcare providers are in the room? Yes. Oh, wow. So really just thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I feel like you know, a lot of the work both of us care about so much is in service of others. Of course. And all of you are dedicating your life for that same purpose. And it's just... I love being at UCSF for this reason. That's really nice. Yes. And one of the things I was wondering in looking over the very heavy and enjoyable book that you've just produced was, what are the lessons that us lay people can learn about compassion? And specifically, when one dedicates their everyday life to the service of others, we can succumb to despair. Mm -hmm. Not only because of suffering, but also because the healthcare system itself is so defunct. Mm -hmm. And so we think about His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and he, he has weathered through not only the explicit suffering of so many people he mm -hmm. loves, mm -hmm. but thus profoundly defunct systems, mm -hmm. yeah. governances. Yeah. And so I wonder from your point of view, for all these natural bodhisattvas in the room, how do they hold on to their compassion? How do they transform what could be despair or frustration as, a, as one person? Because changing this healthcare system is going to take lifetimes. So what well, can I one, I one person... I don't think it has to. I don't yeah. think it has to. I think that you know, they manage in Canada and France and all, Sweden and all kinds of places. Yeah. When, they get the, when they get the God of America, the, of the American theocracy, which is, we, I call it... Mammonocracy. <laughs> and the Dalai Lama asked me when I was saying that he, I, I wanted him not to resign, you know, as the head of the Tibetan state, you know, in exile at the moment, but eventually back in Tibet when, when the Chinese leadership comes to their senses, which I'm sure they will soon. 
And um, I asked, you know, I said, I said, you shouldn't really quit, you know, being the, being a, um, you know, head of state, but you don't have to work. You you can just do your studies and whatever. You're just a symbol, like the king of Norway or something, you know, or the or the queen of England. He says, I don't want to be a prisoner like Lady Di. He says. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, you don't have to be, but you really, they need you, the Tibetans, because, you know, they need a spiritual thing. Yeah. And don't think that America is a really democracy. Mm. America is a theocracy. What do you mean? He says, how, how, how is it democracy? I said, no, they, it's a mammonocracy. I said, we worship money there, and money controls everything at the moment and ruins everything, the, the, the absolute deification of money. Mm. And that's what ruins the healthcare system, of course. Yeah. In the Tibetan medicine, when you study, I studied Tibetan medicine at the insistence of my old root guru, a Mongolian gentleman, when I was a monk, and um, I, I studied it. And in Tibetan medicine, they say, if you want to be a doctor, and you're doing it for profit, or fame, or status, you're going to be a lousy doctor, and you're not going to be successful, and you're going to be frustrated. Mm. But if you do it for compassion, and here's the method, you know, in the you know, hours of course hours, you know, in a Tibetan medical school, there's like many hours of the course of compassion. Mm -hmm. It's something you learn to cultivate. And, uh, you know, the, the, the Tibetan, the, the Buddhists from India actually, and carried on and refined in Tibet, are really very good at that. But, and then it says if you go to, into healing and medicine out of compassion, then you actually will be wealthy and famous and you have high status because people will really appreciate what you do. But it cannot be your motivation. Mm. And it's a marvelous thing and, and, and so you actually study compassion. Now just to, to say that, just, just to, I think I should say one thing since you all are hard working healing people, or most of you, is that compassion doesn't just come from kind of like, oh I feel so sad for you and sorry for you. That, that's called um, compassion that has a notion of love, it says, or affection. It's notional affection or sentimental affection. And it's not necessarily very effective. The compassion that becomes genuine has to do with, it has three levels. And one of them is it's always combined with wisdom, and it comes from wisdom. Mm -hmm. And the f first one is it combines with the wisdom of impermanence. And then second, it combines with the wisdom of what they call personal selflessness. And third, it combines with the wisdom of what they call objective selflessness. And what that means is that when you, you know, every, well, the basic sickness that human beings have, according to the Buddha's, you know, medical insight, actually, rather than religious, is that people have a, are wired to think that they have a fixed identity in the center of themselves that is something separate from and isolated from the world. So relating to the world becomes kind of problematic. And when they especially feel vulnerable or something, they can withdraw into this safe place that is disconnected and never changes. And you can find that in yourself with a my, tiny bit of contemplation when you look at a picture of yourself like 20 years ago at a picnic, when you're a completely different person. And yet, you go, if you can go back into the memory of the event, you then, have, when you click on it, it's like, oh yeah, I was just the same as I am now then. Hmm. And you identify with that. So there's something in the, in the base of your perception, of your memory and your experience, that doesn't change. We all feel that, hmm. you know, unless we're enlightened, and, or to some degree. And, and the, that's where wisdom comes in. When you investigate yourself at wisdom, which means you don't meditate on selflessness or emptiness, you meditate on finding that feeling of an unchanging real me that is really different from everything else in the universe. Mm. And then when you do that, you won't be able to find it, they say. Mm. Although they're always open-minded. Uh, the the Dalai Lama is always ready. Like, if you find absolute self in there, by all means, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've been barking up a wrong tree for thousands of years. But, but basically, you won't find it, and people haven't found it. And what you find then is that you're empty of any non-relational element in yourself. And when you find that, you suddenly feel a kind of, you know, what you say dependent origination, but actually the better word is really relativity. And you realize that you are a, that your sense of separateness from beings is kind of arbitrary boundarying that you do out of habit or, you know, 
uh, you know, self-protection or self, you know, whatever, trauma, it gets even worse, you get more isolated. And that there's no real boundary between you and others. And therefore, that's how, that's why when you fall in love, you kind of really feel the feeling of the beloved, you know, and you become very focused on it, it becomes like a main thing for you. Or when a mother with a child, you know, the Buddhists always mention, you know, like they say an enlightened being is like a mother, sees every other being like a mother sees her only beloved child, you know. And so then, then naturally from sort of your own transparency, in other words, you look into yourself and you sort of become transparent to your own inner vision and then you don't really find that anything in yourself that's an absolute except in your relationships. And then you see everybody else when you, when you don't get clogged inside yourself. And then you, be, you automatically come, become more empathetic. And of course, human beings in general, from Buddhist biological point of view, Buddhists, Buddha, Buddhists had their own Darwin, and his name was Buddha. And he was not worried about monkeys and chimpanzees and genes and crocodiles and whatever at all. It, it was not a big, you know, like those people in Texas who do creationism, you know, they're really upset about being related to some monkey. They don't, they don't want to. And the male doesn't want to be related to a female, you know, the Texan guy, you know, what? But, but, but uh, the Buddhist Darwin didn't mind. Not only are we related to them, we personally have been monkeys, every single one of us. And if we behave like a monkey in this life, we'll be one another time, which is not really good. You can't really get on Facebook as a monkey, you know. And you can't, uh, you can't really chat with people, you know. They just go, uh, 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 you know. So, and worse than a monkey, actually, from Buddhist biological point of view, where the individual mind, which is not really individual in a metaphysical sense, but still is yourself, your relative self, uh, you know, it's infinitely malleable and doesn't end and never becomes nothing and therefore you are a work in progress which, who with an infinite future ahead of you and therefore every little bit that you do that's a little bit better has an infinite positive consequence so don't be discouraged just because you're going to die. Everybody's going to die but what you've done that's good is you and you'll re re reap the fruit of, fruit of that. I know a lot of you are scientific and therefore you think that modern science has discovered that the human mind doesn't go on after death. You think that's a discovery. But I ask you, anybody who thinks that, who has discovered nothing? And do they expect a Nobel Prize for that? Oh, I discovered nothing. Actually, isn't nothing the one thing no one is ever going to discover? Is there any evidence for the existence of nothing? Will there ever be such an evidence? We have a law of thermodynamics. Energy never is destroyed, right? Isn't that a law of thermodynamics? Is your consciousness some kind of energy? Is it no energy? Then it means it's already nothing. <laughs> but you definitely know it isn't nothing right now, right? So you're all, never mind, you know, don't get too worn out and burnt out about healing and curing people because you're, you're not going to get away from your patients even if you die or they do. You're going to meet them in the next life and you're going to have to keep healing them. So you better cultivate your compassion, which will naturally will do when you develop the wisdom of relativity. That you are a relational being, you're capable of being identifying with other beings. That's a human nature. Human is extremely resilient and flexible. That's the greatness of the human being. Why Buddha made such a fuss about human beings? Because we are the most educable of beings, you know, that of life forms that they are. We can criticize ourselves. We can see through us. Men can learn to listen to their wives. It's like miraculous things we can do. And, um, and so anyway, that's, that's what that is. Yes. Okay? That's I, that. Was that okay? I think, I think, I yes. forget the question always, you know. I think I'm the older. One, one more, one more follow-up on yes. that. So, yes. if we want these care providers to have this wisdom of impermanence and selflessness. Yes. So that they can have more capacity for boundless compassion. Yes. How, how do they do that on a daily basis? Well, what, is, what is the task right before they see a patient or right when they face suffering? Right. Well, the, the basis is what's called the royal reason of relativity in Buddhism. It's, a, it's a considered sort of advanced, and, but it's not complicated. It's very easy. In other words, anything that you experience is relative. Hmm. And then, you know, people have experiences that they feel are very absolute. And one that you know that you have, unless you're saintly, 
and I'm not sure actually probably many of you are, mm -hmm. but but one of the things that is when you yourself lose your temper and burst into fury, mm. the impulse to do something like shout or strike or you know say you know whatever it is that when you really lose your temper feels like irresistible to you, doesn't it? Mm. You, it's like something comes from an absolute place inside yourself. I have to say this. I have to say that guy's such a turkey, or, or you know, whatever it is. You know, and you break things that are valuable to you, mm. and you say things you don't mean to people that you love, and so on. And then you're very sorry about it later. But it takes you over and makes you the tool of an ab something that seems to be absolute to you. Mm. But but this is the, where the royal reason of relativity comes in. Mm. It's a logical thing. Buddhists are not just. Uh, duh, staring at the wall, I'm meditating, and that's going to cure everything. That wouldn't cure a single thing. Mm. It would temporarily give you a little peace, you'd stare at the wall for a while. But then you get mad later when somebody comes and disturbs you, or steps on your toe, you're sitting around. What do you mean? I'm staring at the wall, don't bother me. <laughs> and the point is, because you experience something as if it were absolute, it's relative. Mm. You know that logically. And absolute means non-relative, therefore no relative person can be can experience an absolute, hmm. right? But that's logical, simple, hmm. right? It's like no one can be nothing. None of you are going to ever be nothing. I love to say this. We're supposed to be talking a little bit about death, right? Hmm. Tonight. <laughs> so you know what? No one gets out of here a dead. That's my slogan. <laughs> there usually is no one gets out of here alive, right? In this case, no one gets out of here a dead. So everything will follow you again, and you are going to go through it all again. That Bill Murray is a, is a guru of all, of all time. <laughs> you know? What, what was it called? <laughs> yes. He kept having to do it over and over and over until he decided to be a bodhisattva. <laughs> and he helped, the, he helped the old lady. He didn't hit the person with the, with the ladder. He did, you know, he did everything right, you know. He did, he became a compassionate person, you know. Mm. And that's actually a little bit our fate. Mm. And you scientific people who think that's crazy or that's <laughs> religious, what you have to really face is the fact that the blind, that the belief in nothingness, that it awaits you, that is the real condition of you, of your mind, is a blind faith belief. Mm. It's a fundamentalist belief. Because no one will ever know it. Carl Sagan will not show up, you know, on a sequel to cosmos and say, hey guys, I really don't exist, it's cool. <laughs> you can get out of here by dying. You don't have to worry about anything. He's not going to do it. And he didn't do it. And of course, he, no one will ever do it. So you're always going to be here. So therefore, you, your behavior, is, everything becomes more serious about your behavior. And that's how you do every day. You know, you lose your temper, you feel burned out. But it's relational, and so you take a break, you don't lose it, you calm down, you see it from another perspective. You know, you, you, you develop skills that uh, are actually, and in this light, remember that people wrongly define enlightenment as like Einstein, boom, a big light bulb goes off in their head or something. They think that's what it is. That's not what enlightenment is. That could make somebody more egotistical than ever. <laughs> enlightenment is becoming truly compassionate and selfless, mm. and, and therefore, the female is ahead of the male, guys, I'm sorry. They are way ahead of us. You know, they are so kind that they are willing to accept residency of a complete stranger in their belly without rent, no rent, and they'll be there for almost a year. And then that stranger will come out with a tremendously difficult, you know, uh, labor, which is usually uncompensated. It's, there's no overtime, and then it's going to start, you know, devouring them, <laughs> and they will like burst into milk. And which guy is going to do that? <laughs> the guys don't even want to be in the labor room, except, of course, of course modern dads do. You know, I, actually, we had four children, and and three of them they kicked me out, but the last one I did get in, and then you know, I did faint. <laughs> They put a chair under me there. The nurse was so hip. She slipped the chair around me. Like, <laughs> you know, what? And then nobody told me that they were blue. And I, while I was fainting, I was thinking, well, we'll just say he's a little baby Krishna. Never mind. 
I knew it turned pink, luckily, by the time I regained consciousness. <laughs> and, and so enlightenment, if you define it like that, it's a very different story. And therefore, when you, you know, I have another slogan, Buddha is as Buddha does. And so if you control your temper, and if you control your obsession, and you control your determination that you're always right, and you know this and know that, and you're ready to see this from another perspective, then you are developed. That is compassion, and mm. that is positive movement. And we, since we always change all the time anyway, if we don't change in a positive way, we're probably deteriorating. Mm. Watching CNN and realizing that insanity has taken center stage on this, in this society. Mm. <laughs> Talk about needing therapy. <laughs> I won't say any more. <laughs> Yes, Isa. Hi, Bob. Um, following up on your comment about reincarnation. Yes. So His Holiness has said that reincarnation is not just a tenet of faith in Buddhist thought, yes. but it is the uh, result of empirical inquiry. Yes. And I was wondering if you could tell me what he means by this, if you could extrapolate on that statement. Right. Well, you know, the, 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 the root reason, the root thing is that thing about nothing is nothing, you know, Eureka, you know. The human mind reifies concepts, you know, and we feel that if we have a concept for something, it must be there. So we are people who go around, we have a concept nothing, you know, we have a concept chair, and there's a ref, seems to be a referent for chair. So we have a concept nothing, we think there must be a referent. So we think of a dark space, you know, and we think that's where we're going. And it's going to be nice, and we'd like it because, of course, at night we like to sleep. Nobody's scared of falling asleep. You do lose consciousness. You lose control of your environment. You, you hope it's, you know, you lock the door maybe, you turn off the light and make no sound. But, you know, nobody's scared of becoming nothing. Nobody's scared of, of having no feelings and no consciousness. People, people who believe that they won't exist after death think that's really brave of them. But it's not brave to be nothing. We, you know, you start pulling my tooth and be, make me nothing, you know. Okay, bring down the anesthetic, we say. So this is the root of why don't we cure ourselves from climate change? Why don't we turn off things? Why don't we insist that Rex Tillerson change jobs? Well, actually, he did change jobs. That's good, you know. But these guys who are like pumping the grease and the oil and ruining the environment, why are we really accepting it? We don't have to. If we all really say no, it, it's no, you know. And they'll have to, you know, the Exxon Mobil and Chevron, they'll have to do something else, like make solar panels. I don't know why they don't. They have a lot of cash. They could do that instead of exploring for more useless oil that is spoiling the environment. But we do it because we, all of us are lulled into a certain thing by this concept of materialism, dogma of materialism, where we think, well, après moi le déluge, as the French king said, you know, the, the disaster will happen after me, you know. You know, and therefore we care, sure, oh my grandchildren, I really care, but we don't care enough to demand cheap Teslas faster <laughs> and good batteries and no more of this stuff. Like in Germany, you know, they, the angel Angela, I love her, she's so great, and we're supposed to have our own Angela right now, <laughs> but we got cheated out of it, sorry, but you know, we'll get one soon eventually, you know, and maybe you, even if you run for president. <laughs> So my point is that, that she turned off all the nukes and, and distributed electricity generation in northern climate country, Germany. And electricity was getting so cheap that the banks freaked out because all the pension funds were invested in the utilities. And there was plenty of electricity all over the place. And they didn't even have Elon Musk giving them better batteries. Not yet. They will. And so it's easy to make the switch. We shouldn't say, oh, we can't fix the health system. Oh, no. That's where we're brainwashed. Why does only half of America vote? We're brainwashed that your vote doesn't matter. So you don't bother. You know, half of us do, but most of us don't. In Europe, they all vote because they had a world war in their territory. They had Charlottesville, armed Charlottesville for five, six years which was not pleasant, so therefore they vote, because they know that if you don't, you get bad governments, you get lunatics on top, and they cause a lot of damage, right? But we are complacent in this country, because we think, after all, finally it's all nothing, finally I'll get out of it, you know? I call it the circuit breaker, when you're making a huge effort to be different, to be better, 
to restrain your negativities, say at some point there's an inner stress of your self-restraint versus your impulse and your habit, and something goes like click, like a circuit breaker. And that click we express in our American lingo like go for it, or let it all hang out. Or we even say with great courage, what the hell? <laughs> Because we're not afraid of, we don't listen to Garrison Keillor's wonderful Buddhist phrase that the Lutherans say to each other all the time, it could be worse. <laughs> and which makes them insist on, even in the smallest way, making it better. Because there's a, everybody's scot-free. That's a psychotic thing to think there's no consequence to how you live and what you do. That's a basically kind of subliminal psychosis. I'm sorry, but that is Buddhist analysis. So the point is, if there's total relativity, you're related to everything forever, you're forced to absolutely use all your force and power and concentration to make everything just a tiny bit better. You can say, well, actually, that's the secret of long life. I, I, I heard a guy, Haitian guy, who got an award once at a benefit, you know, and he met a man in Haiti. He talked about an incident where he went and rebuilt a school with some non-profit. And he met a man who was 104. And he was saying in this dinner, you know, and I wanted to go see him, find out what his secret was. So I met him. He was sitting on a porch. And I said, how could you live to 104? What's the secret of such a long life? And in this benefit, all these wealthy people were <laughs> leaning forward and eating their steaks and whatever. And they're leaning forward. And, and he said, the 104-year-old man said to him, you see this lady over here, this 103-year-old lady? Whatever she says, I say, you're right, dear. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I really like that one. <laughs> I do. I do. So, you know, and it's little things, baby steps. That's another Bill Murray teaching. What about Bob? Did you ever see What About Bob? Yeah. If not, that's homework. You should go see What About Bob. You know, he... He goes and he goes around with his, uh, his, his, his little fish in a plastic bag, you know, and he, baby steps, baby steps. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go meditate for 10 years and do this and that. Just a little bit change, you know, a little, you know, if you get, lose your temper, like, instead of four minutes, you lose for two, you know. You, you know, you, you just, a little bit, that's a huge event, achievement. And because also you can go downhill bit by bit and really easily do. So you, when you know that, you make sure that you're always going uphill. That's, that's the practice of compassion. Like the Lama likes to say, I still lose my temper, but now it blows over really quickly. He said, right? But he doesn't really much lose it. He's not, he's pretty, he's kind of cute. He's, he's really quite sweet. Uh, so Bob, His Holiness has said that reincarnation is not just a tenet of Buddhist faith. Oh, yeah, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Lost track. Yes. Well, you see... The thing is, Carl Sagan might come back, you know, Carl Sagan might come back as a, as a graduate student somewhere, you know, and he might, he might have a eureka, a eureka, I can make a cosmos again, something. A lot of people remember previous lives. It's not that uncommon, and nor, nor is it that difficult. And, uh, and of course, that's evidence, okay? That's empirical evidence. Now, the materialist is invited to go and try to debunk any particular incident. You know, where someone says they remember some, some, there's a, some great ones. One of my favorite is the one that Ian Stevenson, you know, who was a professor of psychology at University of Virginia for years, he collected them. And my favorite one there is a guy who was born in a southern part of Sri Lanka with a birthmark, a red birthmark on his neck. And when he reached an age of speaking, like, you know, three, four, five, he kept saying to his parents, I'm not so-and-so, your son, I'm your previous son, who, who did an evil thing, and I want to do something about it. And, and, they, and they started to shut him up. They had moved to a different province in Sri Lanka because they had had a son whose engagement was broken off with a, with a, with a lady, uh, the family, for some reason, and then he got really upset, and he murdered his you know, ex fiance And there was a big case, and it was a scandal, and so forth. And these people were doctors, and they moved far away and changed the name and everything. And this kid, remember, he was the rebirth of that son. And he wanted to do something. And eventually, when he got big enough, he went back and he endangered himself to the other family to try to make up for the horrible damage he had done to them. And so, in other words, 
The family got nothing out of him having that memory. He really didn't get anything out of it. He didn't get on TV. He didn't get on, you know, a Larry King or something. He just, he just went and tried to make up for that terrible thing he had done in the previous life. So there's many, many documented cases like that, where there's no motive to make, you know, write a bestseller or something, you know, and yet they remember. So those can be case by case reviewed. And there is a great book that I like for you, materialists, by a lady whose name I can't remember, but you can easily find it on Google it's, or at Amazon. It's called Spooks. <laughs> and she's debunking the rebirth things. And she even goes to see these different stories of children who remember another family. And, she, and she, there's some really weird things that go on in America. There's a guy who kills dogs in a, in a weight uh, chamber, you know, and then sees if they get lighter. When the, and it's funded by some government thing, talk about the, the award, you know, the useless award. And, and there are things like this. She finds such things, that lady, and debunks them all. And then she tries to debunk the others, but then she gets kind of convinced in some of them, some child, you know, who knows everybody and the way people talk. It goes to India and does this. It's very good, humorous, excellent book. And then she says, well, okay, maybe I could begin to buy into this. She says, even though her main purpose is not to, she says, but nobody could ever tell me what is the mechanism by which the memories would go from one, one embodiment, you know, one brain to another. How could that happen? And I've always meant to, I, I confess I didn't do it, but I meant to try to find her and give her a copy of the Book of the Dead, <laughs> which shows how you have what we might call something like a mental gene, you know, where, you're, where the way you lived in life and how open-hearted you are versus how close-hearted and close-minded you are sort of encodes itself in a super subtle place like a, like, a, like a material, an energetic molecule, but it's very super subtle, you know, super micro. And, um, and then that connects to the parental genes in a rebirth, if you're reborn as a mammal, and, and then therefore it's a three gene meeting. And in the Book of the Dead, it's kind of very cute because it's, and it's patriotic for Americans and French people and Russians because the mother's gene is, you know, symbolically thought of as red, you know, related to the blood, and the father's gene is white, related to semen, and the, and the spiritual or mental gene is blue. So you have blue in the center of red and white. And the, the way the mechanism is described in the Tibetan sort of neuroscientific uh, way of describing the mechanism of rebirth. And it's quite actually interesting and marvelous. So, so the empirical thing is basically really the memories, and, um, and the logical thing is that all nature has continuity. The, you know, the burden of proof is on a person who would say something can become nothing, which is actually a senseless thing, acknowledged in the material world by even scientists with, by the second law of thermodynamics. You know. And since, uh, since mind is some kind of energy, it's, uh, it's no more mysterious. Actually, in physics, energy has no mass. You know that. The difference between mass, matter, and energy is that energy has no mass. So, you know, even our mental, in our mind, where we think of billiard balls banging into each other, energy affects matter, but it has no mass, so it can't bang into it. You know, unless you multiply the speed of light and square it and make it, then blow up a, blow up a bomb, like E equals MC squared, you know. So that's even a mystery, too. So, so it shouldn't be that mysterious to us. After all, how long ago did Crick and Watson, sitting in their lab, Actually, as it turned out later, it was revealed somewhat stoned, <laughs> discovered the double helix. That was only recently, and now that's sort of normal to everybody, but that's completely a magical thing. It's like, it's incredible. And now they're like editing genes and doing all these things. But that, you know, 30, 50 years ago, that was like, that would have been mysticism, right? People can have boundary slippage. In fact, we seek boundary slippage. Why do they go to like, you know, go to like, uh, like the cyclone? You know, there's like the, the entertainment parks or whatever they're called, and uh, they go to like Ravi Shankar concerts or <laughs> rock and roll or they fall in love or like what everybody wants boundary slippage. That's what they're looking for. <laughs> Why? Because it's a pain in the neck to be all like bounded up and on me and like, don't mess with me. You know, uh, Wilhelm Reich, the great psychologist, called that the emotional plague, the person who couldn't feel streaming, you know, in their own body and therefore they got all uptight and went around and wanted to kill somebody or something or torture them, you know. It's a terrible thing, the great Wilhelm Reich, you know. And that's why you're all thinking people come and they help you slip your boundaries, you know. <laughs> and you people are in California, you know about that. <laughs> or, all you have to do is go from New York to San Francisco and your boundaries slip, I'll tell you. <laughs>
And, and you, it, unfortunately, you have to go back. You have to go back. You don't need, you don't need acid or drugs, etc. You know, you just need to go to California. <laughs> And, uh, and it, it's great here, you know, it's really nice. So it's always an honor to be here with all you Californians. You know. Brief boundary slipping Californians. Brief follow-up. Two million of you voted for our own Angela Merkel, our own homegrown chip on cheek Angela Merkel. We, we voted, we, we, two, three million of you here extra voted so the, no one could cheat you out of the vote. More people voted elsewhere too, but they were, the margin was so small they could cheat them. So, and not the Russians either. Let's. Let's talk popular. about death and not depressing things like politics. What's that? Let's talk about death and not depressing things like the politics. Politics are not so. depressing. Oh, no, that's they are true. Not. They're not. But but politics, the follow up, follow up to Vimala Kirti. Opportunity for joy. Ah. If you do it yourself, and okay. don't just sit back and expect somebody else to do it, which is what we've been doing, and therefore we've gotten these people who are not doing it. You know, they don't realize they're servants of the people. You know, you take an oath that you're going to serve the people, and, with, and you take it with, 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 without reserve or purpose of evasion. And if you sign documents that you're never going to raise taxes, even if it goes bankrupt, if you're trying to destroy the government, you are self-impeached. And we shouldn't let that go on any further, and we're not going to let it go on, are we? We can't afford to. We can't afford to. The, the Dalai Lama, the Tibetans, the Chinese, the South Koreans, even the North Koreans, they're expecting us to maintain our democracy and be sensible and be nice. The North Korean guy, look at his hairdo. He wants to come, he wants to come over here with Dennis Rodman and join the village people and have a good time. It's no fun blowing up bombs and like that. That's really that's a secondary kind of boundary slippage, you know. It's not a good one, you know. So the follow-up. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, you have a colleague at Columbia named Brian Green. Do yes. You, know? uh, you must know him. He's an astrophysicist and a mathematician. Quantum, and he writes quantum, about quantum guy. Little interesting quantum. stuff like string theory too. Yeah, yeah. And the multiverse. So my yes. question to you is: the Vilmakirti and other Buddhist doctrines mm -hmm. talk in such a way that people like Brian Green talk in terms of almost an infinite number of universes. Yes. Yeah, well, that, well, but you know, I, I, there's this physicist named Henry Stepp, and he really delighted me a few years ago when he mentioned about the Copenhagen interpretation, 1926, Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg. And they then announced to Einstein and all of the assembled, you know, those guys in the 20s, physicists, you know, who later made the A-bomb and so on, with their beards, you know, and their thing, you know. And they're all sitting there in Copenhagen. And they said, you know, guys, you know, mind exists in the universe. This idea of absolute objectivity of matter is false. When you get down to a certain level of micro in the quantum world, below the wave particle paradox type of thing, then you can't pursue objectivity because your act of observation and measurement interferes with the object because your mind is involved in it. So there is no absolute objectivity and you can't get there. You, you, no theory will capture reality at the super micro level, you know, where it's pure, it's on the, it's on the boundary of pure speed of light, you know, the event horizon of speed of light where mass becomes infinite, you know. Right? You know that, where a particle, you can't tell if it's a particle or a wave or whatever it is, or a rock and roll song. And those guys have a good string theory, going plink, plink, you know. So, point is, Einstein said famously, God does not play dice. And I refuse, I'm going to have the grand unified theory, you know. I'm not going to accept that. And he led a rebellion of those kind of theorists, you know, with their mathematics and the whole thing, because they don't want to accept that. They, they feel too insecure, the idea that ultimately reality itself there's a little identity slippage going on right under our feet. Even though the A-bomb taught that to the subliminal consciousness of the whole planet, without question. That, if, you know, the, that is to say, the, the solid business in your own finger and the tip of your nose, the atoms there, it caught in a chain reaction, have released an energy that will pulverize you instantaneously. We all subliminally know that. You know, even though we're like, not me, I'm solid, right? you know, I own, um, you know, I have a Cadillac, you know, whatever. <laughs> and 
and and but that there was that insecurity came in people, and they don't want to do that. But actually, if they do that, then they surf their life. They can feel a little more relaxed and better. They don't have to control everything. The reason I mention that is that there's multiverses and things like that. These are things that the working physicists who are working on the surface of probability, the quantum people, and inventing things and actually doing useful things, they're the ones who conceded we can't grab it with a theory. You know, you, you can be reality, but you can't control it with some concept or theory. You know, and because you can deal with probabilities and you can manipulate the surface in creative and therapeutic ways and helpful ways and create wonderful things, right? So they pay no attention, Henry Sapp told me, the working quantum people pay no attention to those theorists because you cannot experimentally prove or disprove their, you know, string theory, multiple, whatever. Of course there could be multiple, who knows? You know, we, we're all made of light, you know? We all dissolve into light, ourselves. And we can't catch ourselves, you know? But we can enjoy ourselves, it's like a surfer. Surfer, you got Californians, come on. He's riding that wave. You can't grab the wave and control it and write a theorem and then I'm, okay, I'm going to sit this way on the wave. You do that, you'll drown. You'll be crashed into the rocks. You have to flow with it, right? So we all have to do that with reality. That's what they, 1926 they discovered that and that's what the Buddhists discovered. Impermanence, when you, when you discover that, it's not that you become a Buddhist, they say you enter the stream, okay? Sotapanna means stream enterer. That's the first stage of beginning to get liberated from the prison of rigid identity. Me versus you and me versus the universe, which is a miserable situation, right? If you are something absolutely different from the entire universe, who is going to win that confrontation? <laughs> Do you think it's going to be you? You know? And you know, Buddhist thing is not religion. It's just, it's it's psychology. You're healers. It's healing. Everyone in this room thinks, and as if it was a normal and correct thing to think, that they're the center of this room. That's why everybody in this room is paranoid, because you know that nobody else agrees with you. <laughs> they don't think you're the center, and not only that, they have the goal to think they're the center, and they are a bug with you that you don't agree with them. And so when you're perceiving the world like that, it's a problem. Well, how nice am I going to be? How selfish am I going to be? Or is it only intelligent to be really selfish or what? You know? And you'll never win that struggle. Death will get you. Sickness will get you. Your beloved will get sick of you and divorce you. You know, it will not, you know, it won't work. Right? Whereas, if you're still a little different, but it's kind of, you're related. You're, everyone is your relative, you know? And you're sort of, you're not really different. And therefore, when someone else has a success or fortune or joy, is joyful, when your friend or your roommate or your spouse or your child come home one day and they say, I'm so happy, I don't even know what's, I, I can't even express myself, I'm just really happy. And then you say, well, what happened to you? Did you drink someone? Are you on a manic cycle? Is there something wrong with you? <laughs> you're not happy with them. And then finally, if you decide they're, they're not, there's nothing bad that they did, they're just happy because, you know, we have a sensitivity to be happy from within our being, then you feel, well, how come I'm not happy? <laughs> you feel jealous. A little begrudging, let's call it, if you like them. I mean, let's not say jealous, that sounds so bad. But you feel like that, don't you? And actually, what? In, in, in Protestant ethic industrial societies, happiness is more or less illegal. Wouldn't you say? Unless you pay for it. Exactly. So was it, what was the question? <laughs> that other guy in the other universe asked it. I don't even know what the question was. <laughs> uh, so it is like that. You know, this is hard for us. You know, I've been teaching for 50 years. Uh, you know, I've been transmitting what my wife has been teaching to me, <laughs> the Dalai Lama, to my students. And... And you know, they, they, oh, I want to learn about Buddhism. And I want to empty my mind. I don't want to think. You know, on my, because I have anxiety all the time when I think. So, can I meditate? And all this. But that's not Buddhism. Anybody can meditate. Anybody can stop thinking. It won't help, actually, because when you start thinking again, you get anxious again. <laughs> and, and you have to use your intelligence to understand something and learn something. 
And the idea that we are supposed to be so advanced, and we are the advanced civilization, and we are really civilization, and those pre-modern people, backward, underdeveloped, right? That they could have figured out something about the human mind thousands of years before us, and had actually a higher culture. That the Asian people who were conquered by the Brits, and the Portuguese, and the Dutch, and the French, might have been conquered because they were more gentle and more civilized, actually, than those weird Brits who had the horrible Yorkshire pudding that was like <laughs> shoe leather, and they didn't have any spices, and they didn't have curry, and they didn't have mangoes, and they, they of course they had to conquer the world. You know? No diamonds, just tin, you know, and coal. And, and uh, that would, therefore the bullies of the planet are the less civilized, in fact. And, uh, you know, even in people who study Buddhist studies, I tell my colleagues, I say, you guys don't even believe Buddha was enlightened. I know you don't. You don't think he had a higher consciousness. Why? He didn't have a PhD from Stanford. <laughs> so therefore, he couldn't be more, uh, more aware of reality, some aspects of it anyway, than you. Right? But actually, this is something we have to learn. We are, you know, we are, have a, lot, a long way to go. And we have to, be, to become uh, the peaceful, the creators and the arbiters of peace that we want to be. And we can be and we're going to be. Okay? And the Dalai Lama expects us to be. And, uh, and uh, we have a ways to go. But, but you people are going there because you're here tonight talking about learning from dying. You know, dying was illegal to talk about dying. You know, right? The doctor was freaked out. You know, he's written... You know, body bag, you know, on the, on the little you know, clipboard there. Body bag, you know, when someone's ready to go. But they don't, oh, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> oh, I'll be by tomorrow. We'll see you, you know. And then there's this body bag. Because you know? you're not supposed to let them know. It's like, oh, embarrassing, you know. And the family, you don't tell the family, you know, now they have hospice. We're beginning to get into it. And actually, dying and being aware of dying brings you to life. And why do they hide death from you in an industrial society? Well, as Elizabeth Kubler-Ross said, the, one of the pioneers of making people more aware of death in our, in our civilization or our culture, she said, after being with 10,000 people when they died, she said, I never met a single one who deeply regretted not having spent another day at the office. <laughs> she said, if you, if you are more aware of your death, even though it may it for all of you here be a hundred years from now, but if you really face it and are aware of it and don't live in denial of it in a certain level, then you want to be alive now. You, know, you don't know when it could happen, so you want to make the most of this moment. You know. It doesn't mean you're only in the moment in some, in some irresponsible manner like the way some people sell being in the moment, but it means you still want to make this a better moment because you know you have a limited number of them. And being aware of death brings you very strongly to life, especially if you know that death is a doorway to a next one. And you don't want to repeat some of the mistakes you just now. I love to tell this to American audiences. You're going to fall in love with and marry your ex again and again and again <laughs> and again. So don't get too vicious a lawyer and make a bad arrangement. <laughs> And you're going to fall in love again. And you make a better round that. They'll have a better lawyer next time if you don't be nice now. <laughs> take it, okay, take care of it. So Americans need to hear that. I like that myself. So, so learning from dying means learning to be more alive. And that I, you know, when I, I was asked by someone to trans, retranslate parts of the Book of the Dead when I, years ago in the, in the 70s, in the, oh, in the 80s, and... Um, I didn't think it was already been translated why I bother, but, but then I did. And then when I did, it was this amazing thing. I came, the insight I got in the process of working on thinking a lot about it is there's no dead people. You know, they, there are no dead people. People are instantly alive in another form. So there's no dead people lurking around. There are a few people who get stuck in what's called the between state, the bardo or the between state, because they're so f obsessed about something in their past, previous life, they, they try to get back in their body. They, they, you know, they, there's, a, there's a whole thing about that. And they can be like ghostly and so forth like that. But, uh, but basically, people are always going on. You know? And therefore, Tibet is very unique among Asian societies, and I think all societies, in that they don't really fuss about their ancestors. Much less, they don't have ancestor cults in Tibet. 
Why? Because grandpa is not sitting up there waiting for a cookie and a cup of tea <laughs> in a ritual. Grandpa might be your neighbor. You, you might be grandpa or grandma. You might be or grandpa. I might have been grandma. In other words, everybody's recycling, so they're coming back. So you want to save that cup of tea for your friend because they might be your relative. It's a, it's a wonderful, the, the karma biology theory, the karma Darwinian theory, uh, where the individual continues, you know, individual not in a metaphysical but a social sense continues. It's wonderful all the byproducts that it has. Luckily, Buddhism has no absolute theory. It's a relational theory, but you have better and worse ones, true and false, valid, invalid. It's a relational matter. No theory about something is absolute. It's contextual, all theory. You know? Buddhists were aware of that hermeneutical principle thousands of years ago. So, so, we, so learning from dying is really good. And thinking about it, Dalai Lama himself, he practices something which we can all practice, which is six times a day. And he, which is you take, a, he takes like a letter, in him it's the letter HUM, in the Tibetan form, H-U-M. You can do it in English. And then what he does is he visualizes the letter unraveling, you know, the M, and then the U, and then the H from the bottom, and finally there's a little squiggle left, and then that disappears. So he, in other words, he practices rehearsing letting go. And this then makes him then, and of course he didn't die, but I'm saying that you, we all go through that. And actually we all go through it every night when we fall asleep. But we usually we're so exhausted because we overwork and we want to achieve and accomplish something because we're industrialized in our mentality. And so we usually just pass out. But if you fall asleep slowly, you sort of gradually lose consciousness in a certain way and different senses get quiet in a certain sequence. And you can learn to be more aware of that, actually. And that can be a good practice. Because, and then you, with great relief, you do release your consciousness. And so these are all good at, you know, boundary. These are all good practices. At Dalai Lama does it all the time. That's learning from dying. And then, and then you wake up. This is, but this is a very important thing. Actually, I teach this at, we have a, a Tibet house, our place in the U.S., in New York. But it has U.S. I wish, I want to make one here in California before I die, actually, a second one. But we have one in New York. And then we have a little place in the country called Menla. And there we do retreats or work in weekend workshops or week-long workshops, things like that. And, and um, we have a, I have a sleep meditation there that I teach everybody. And it's like kind of patented for Menla, but I'll share it. Menla means medicine Buddha, you know. But I'll share it with you guys. And that is, when you sleep, one thing that's not good about our sleeping is we have a notion, because we turn off the lights, we, you know, we put earplugs if we're in a noisy place, or we, you know, go in a quiet room, soft pillow, and then we lose consciousness safely, you know. And then we do that, right, every night. And, um, but unfortunately, I think we assume that what, we, what our body is doing while we're unconscious, well, we might be dreaming, but anyway, what the body is doing when we're not paying attention to the physical body is it's lying quietly in a dark space. And we associate that subliminally with our materialist, consensual reality that... It, that uh, that's the ground of being. The ground of reality is this dark nothingness, because we wrongly are thinking nothingness is there. It's something. You know, it's a cosmic. You know, you take the atom apart, there's a nothing in there. You know, which is a mistaken idea. So the Buddhists have a view of what they call the clear light of emptiness, and what it is, it's like in quantum physics. It's like something they call the zero quantum point energy field, vacuum energy field. And, it's, and mathematically, there's a thing like where that, that, that quantum vacuum has an infinite potential energy, has infinite energy. It's like, but when energy is infinite, it doesn't have to do anything because everything's already done. It's like, it's a, it's a paradox, you know, it's something they cope with in the, the quantum people. And so, visualize before you go to sleep. Yes, I'm going to lose consciousness and I'm going to go into a plane of darkness at some point, which I associate with losing consciousness. But then without me noticing it, because I didn't train myself like that, I'm going to go into this zero quantum point clear light of the void field. And that field has infinite energy, which won't do anything to me, doesn't molest or interfere with me, but every cell in my body can draw whatever it needs from that field because it has infinite energy and can therefore share it without loss. 
And that's why you feel wonderful in the morning. You wouldn't feel wonderful if you were lying in nothingness. What would you get from nothingness? You'd be just as tired as when you went to sleep. But you, you, when you bet your mind out of the way and your body really opens its boundary and relaxes because you have no sense of boundary when you're sound asleep. And then this infinite energy underlying in the cosmos which you could call God's love if you're a theist or you could just call the infinite energy of the quantum zero point field if you're a scientist. <laughs> and you therefore feel really energized and ready to go in the morning because you've gotten the clear light of the void has like pumped you up. <laughs> okay? So this is a great sleep yoga. And when people do that, they tend to pop up in the morning and they, they complain less about the food and the whatever, you know, at the retreat center. And they feel happy and they feel <laughs> alert and energized. So try that when you sleep. Don't think of yourself as lying in darkness. Think that you, you, leave, you leave the body alone in darkness, but then your body and brain and everything goes into this plane where there's endless positive energy. It's a big job for us Western people uh, and modern consensual reality, whether religious or spirit or, or materialist, it's a big job for us to try to come up with the idea that the good is more powerful than the bad guys. We're pretty indoctrinated to think that a little bit of goodness is kind of foolish. It's like it's like a a little flashlight against the sun, you know, or against a raging fire. It's a little tiny little cup of water against a raging fire. We're really a bit depressed, actually, because we are taught to feel that. And that's why we're less active, and we should overcome that. Good is actually more powerful, you know, finally. Or we wouldn't be hanging around. Gandhi was really beautiful about that. Somebody, it's in the Gandhi movie, in case you'd like to see that beautiful movie again by Richard Attenborough. And one of his things goes wrong because some people in the strike that he called, and he's fasting, they got angry and they burned down a police station and killed some police, so he calls off the fasting and, you know, it seems hopeless. Some, an American woman who was his disciple came and said, Mr. Gandhi, don't you get really discouraged when everything you do goes wrong and it doesn't happen? And he says, no, he says, I don't get discouraged. He said, yes, those people lost control and they did something violent to the poor police people. And so we stopped the thing, he said, but what I reflect on is that the weave and fabric of human society is like a weave of kindness. In that same time that they burned down that one police station, many people restrained their wish to burn something down. Many people helped another person, old lady across the street. They pumped some water for someone. They carried something here and there. Someone cooked for someone else. People wouldn't, we wouldn't be doing this if different people didn't do things for each other all the time. And I just think of that vaster fabric against the surface of which these exceptional, nasty things take place. And of course, a war is the time when it seems like everything is that. But even in war, some people are cool. There's a wonderful Buddhist uh, former life story of the Buddha that I really like, where he is in that previous life, he's the king of the gods in the, their Olympus. And they have fights with the demons all the time, the titans. They're always having wars with them. Because the demons are always trying to take over the heaven, Olympus, you know, they, they, and they always fail, but they try. So there's this one time when the king of the gods is temporarily being beaten back by the demons and he's going through a forest trail, very narrow forest trail, running away in his chariot. And there's, he sees an eagle's nest in his, with, the, with the flagpole that sticks up off the, car, off the, the wagon. And he realizes that the pole on his wagon is going to knock down the eagle chicks and smash the nest. So he screeches, tells his chariot here to screech to a halt. And he says, this is not, part, they're not my enemy in the war. I can't destroy those chicks. Well, just because I'm fighting with the demons. Turn this chariot around. You know? And he makes the guy turn around and says, but your majesty, you're going to go right back single-handedly against that army of the demons. He says, never mind, I'm, they're not part of the war. I'm not killing those eagle chicks. He says, and then he charges there, and of course, typical Buddhist happy ending story, that they think he's got all the other soldiers, that God, divine soldiers, at his back, and they run away. All the, so, <laughs> but because he didn't want to harm that, those little eagle chicks in the middle of a battle. And I think soldiers and people like that in battles, they do kind things in between all this and that, you know, even in war. So anyway, that's all. We, we are going to be stopping, as we said we would, at 9 o'clock. Bob was on the radio oh, yeah. for an hour this morning. He was at the Commonwealth Club for an hour speaking. 
he's, he's still got energy to go for a few more hours, but he might save that energy to sell a few more books. And he, you, would, you would sign books if people oh, came sure, up? Sure. Okay. Oh, sure. Oh, the Dalai Lama and, book? Yeah. Yes, I and, feel that's him. Yeah. You know, I, and, and, and I'm just going to... I want to just say, yeah, that Dalai Lama no. book will cheer you up. Okay. Yeah, it will. Yeah. It will cheer you up because will. He, you see, you know, he's Mr. Cute, you know, Dalai Lama, so nice. Eh? And, and, but he always says, don't just go for somebody because they're cute. They could be idiots. <laughs> but, you know, you have to weigh what they do and say and see what they do. He says, but point is you have to see him being kind and sweet and even cheerful and optimistic and not despaired against the terrible things that have happened to Tibet for the last 60 years, you know. And they're actually kind of almost like, really like a genocide, but you could say ethnocide is what I like to say, like ethnic genocide, you know, cultural genocide is what he says. But, you know, because of the silly thing that they're afraid that if the Tibetans still are Tibetans, someday they'll want their country back. Because it's a different country than China, actually. They're a different altitude. But, but, they, but, the, but he doesn't know how practical they are. They're happy to be part of China, especially when China is getting rich and they can be nice. And also Chinese were Buddhists for thousands of years. So, and the Chinese used to sponsor Tibet in a wonderful way. The Manchu Empire, the Ming Empire, the, the Yuan Empire. They used to like Tibet. Before that, they actually had war because Tibetans were warriors before that, and they conquered China a couple of times in the Tang Dynasty and so on. But they liked the Chinese, and every Tibetan likes Chinese cooking. <laughs> and they, they love it, you know, it's not a problem. And so they, but they're, they're, they're too insecure, the communists, you know, they think that, oh, if we leave the Tibetans be Tibetan, they'll demand the country back and so forth, and people will realize we grabbed it after the new world order of the, world, of the UN, and you're not supposed to invade another country. Look at the Kuwait story, you know. But that's all right. Dalai Lama doesn't mind. He wants to be part of China. He's told them a hundred times. And I think the ones who know better know that he does. But they pretend they don't believe him and he's trying to be a separatist because they don't want to have it all come out in the open and, and really know everyone knows the true story of what happened. So if you read the book and you see the real terrible suffering that Tibetans have gone through, it's like the standing rock mm of 60 year long standing rock resistance to, in, it's not really even Chinese in particular, it's industrialization and colonialism. It's for, Marxism is Western, you know. China is like mobilized into, let's make more money, you know, like the Western. Before that, they liked to double dig and cook and play Go, and they were good with chopsticks, and they were cool, they were kind of cute before that. And then they got all Westernized, and now we have to conquer the world. Uh, but which is kind of silly because they can't. No one can conquer the world. Everybody's got an A bomb in their hip pocket, mm -hmm. and so everyone has to get along. That means, you know. So you'll really cheer up. So please learn it, take it, show it to your children. We made it as a comic book, but grown-ups like it too. It's much easier than reading a long book of boring print. Nowadays, you know, you don't want to read a long print book because you immediately want to get back on Facebook or Instagram, whatever. <laughs> So this with the pictures, it carries you through and you get a sense of the whole life and you see what a great hero he was. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't show himself as a hero in his autobiographies because he's a humble, simple Buddhist monk. Mm -hmm. But he actually is a hero. He is responding, he is doing what Jesus said and Buddha said, which is love your enemy. Do, hatred will never put an end to hatred. Violence will never put an end to violence. He wants to talk to the rulers of China and Xi Jinping, he will talk to Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping likes him, actually, and we'll see what happens when Xi Jinping has the power to change that stupid policy that he inherited. Okay? So that's, so, so that's it. That's, that's a little commercial for the book, I'm sorry. Yeah. But I really, and, and it also Tibet House published the book. We're the publisher, so you're helping the cultural, His Holiness's Cultural Preservation Center in the U.S. by buying the book. So buy the book. Yes. Okay? I, I, I will plug for the book. I read the entire thing this morning. You did? I had no idea you are it was going <laughs> It was going to capture my interest so much. And it, I think it, it really relates to one last thing I wanted to hear you speak on, which is this incredible compassion of His Holiness, right? It's, it's yeah. not just the warm, fuzzy, like laughable. Yeah. It, is, it is fierce. Yeah, Can it, be. Is, it is strong. And yet one thing I struggle with teaching here at UCSF to residents who are facing burnout and despair is how do we balance this kind of relative self you're talking about, not getting too caught up in me with profound sense of self-worth 
yes. lack of compassion for oneself and then giving it to another person first. Yes, well... And he mm -hmm. doesn't seem to struggle. His, his, his natural proclivity of, of love seems to just flourish. So I wonder... Well, yeah. that's his slogan, you know, world peace through inner peace. Mm -hmm. And people do have this kind of love. Human beings are loving, compassionate beings, but fundamentally, you know. If you really, when you really get the idea of the, the, the Buddhist multiple life Darwinian view, mm. and you realize that if a really paranoid and vicious person, when they are, you know, exploring uh, biological reality, and they see the human form, the wimpy looking human, mm. with no hide, no thick skin, no claws, no big fangs except vampires in Hollywood, and, and no, no venom, nothing, you know, and soft, you know, then they're not really attracted to that. They want to be like a crocodile or a gorilla or something like And, you know, you wouldn't be reborn as a human if you wanted to be a killer. It really wouldn't work. And, you know, you want to, you, a human being is this malleable, soft, interconnected thing. They're mammals, you know. And, um, and of course, humans have more fun, you know, uh, because, they, you know, you don't really have, like, crocodile foreplay. <laughs> I'm sorry, or elephant, you know, if you've ever seen an elephant mating movie they made in Thailand, it's really horrendous, you know, that, <laughs> that poor Mrs. Elephant, she like runs away knocking over trees, <laughs> and, and, and because it's so big, that big elephant, and he, my wife hates this when I do this, and he, he has a terrible time because he has a big erection which he steps on as he's chasing her, <laughs> and it's like a log in itself, he mixes it up with a tree trunk, it's terrible, it's just no fun. No fun at all. So, so therefore, people who want to have fun like are attracted to human form. You know, soft skin, and you can caress and give a hug and a kiss. It's really sweet, you know, the human life. And, uh, you know, tigers are not, they don't, they, you know, lion doesn't really get it on much, you know, like now and then, you know, and then, then, then they sleep the rest of the year. It's like, they're so bored. So, so, so you won't you you have tremendous resources. All of you who work as therapists and as healers or doctors, you did that. You were attracted to that field because you had a wish to do something for other people. You did. You might end up well. Then you get lured into being a super specialist and working for Hoffman La Roche or Pfizer or something and make a lot of money. And you might get lured into that in order to pay off your Tesla or whatever. But, but. You know, put send your kid to Harvard where it should be free if they can make the grade. This ridiculous student in, you know, in, you know, impoverishment and debt laden. No way. When we get our own Angela Merkel, she's going, in her inauguration day, she's going to cancel all student debt. 100%. <laughs> they should not, you should not start off with a huge ball and chain of some terrible bank interest being paid for your learning how to help other beings better and more effectively by becoming educated and becoming more selfless, which is what all learning really aims at. You know, it, critical thinking that we talk about in liberal education, it means being critical about everybody's like self-importance mm. and being full of themselves and being more aware of in reading great heroes and literature, war and peace means less war and so on. And, that, and that's all about that education and that's our human thing is to be a lifelong education is the thing. I love to tell students on parents day when the parents come, you know, don't rush out to get out and be a wage slave in life. You're in your best time now when you're doing what humans are really best and able to do, which is learn. Mm. You know, aha, eureka, you know. So therefore, stay in school as long as your parents will pay. <laughs> <laughs> and the parents go, oops. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I get fun out of that. <laughs> so, so you don't have to burn out. You, you realize that, uh, you know, you don't take it. You know, the burnout actually comes from this fixated uh, sense of identity. Mm and you're fixated on the disease of the person or the, the discomfort of the person that you're on, mm -hmm. and you sort of don't let yourself see that there's an underlying glow and the health in there, and the, you know, their, their leg might be falling off, but their arms aren't, you know? Mm -hmm. So you don't see it from a different, broader perspective. And you just, and you, that's why you see compassion without impermanence, mm -hmm. that the suffering person can be changed, that their situation can change. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, death, death is not that bad. Death can, is a kind of a gas, actually. And the, these people, if you read the, another great literature to read is the near-death experience literature, you know. 
because the people who do that, then they often they get down out there, they meet Jesus or Buddha or Mary or Tara or whatever they're expecting to meet, you know, some benevolent energy they meet. And then sometimes they're like going out into the light and it's really cool, like a Steven Spielberg movie, and they're feeling like they got rid of that ache and that pain and the crappy body that wasn't working. And, uh, and then the, th the guy, the angel says, nope, not your time, get back there, you got more to do. Go back in there and get patched up from that auto accident and have a new hip and whatever it is. And they say, oh no, you know, they don't want to go back. <laughs> they don't want to. I mean, the part of letting go, if you haven't lived the life of letting go and you haven't cultivated the ability to let go more, then the letting go part can be very agonizing for people because they, 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 they know they're going somewhere where they won't have control. They're having to go with the flow, finally. That's the ultimate go with the flow, is dying. But once you let go, then it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic death. It's, a, it's a ecstatic. It is for, for beings. Unless someone's really freaked out and paranoid, and they, and they feel really guilty about things. That's why people like to go and forgive everybody and be forgiven and you know divest themselves of this and that and not go with a grudge into into death. They, you know they don't want to. And even if they're materialists and they think they're going to be nothing, I, I saw this with my grandfather. They want to hedge their bets. <laughs> oh yeah, Carl Sagan. Yes, I'm going to be nothing. I'm not scared of that. I'm going to be brave and face it. But Rabbi, please come and give me a little blessing and minister and whatever. Dalai Lama, come and mm, might be a little something out there. And uh, please, let's see, see if I can be reborn in a good neighborhood with a good mom. <laughs> you know. So, so then you won't burn out because you'll see that, you know, there's baby steps. You know, you can do something for this misery here. But when you think that's the only thing, the misery. Then, then, then you get burned out, you know. And I can't do anything. And you, know, you do what you can, you know, and then you relax. You take it easy. What did you say? Relax and take it easy. Did you say relax and yeah, take it easy? Sure. What an idea! Why don't we all do that <laughs> about right now and finish up? And I need to just thank a couple of people. If it's okay to finish up, is, sure. are people okay with finishing up? Okay. First, yeah. Well, but here's the thing. <laughs> Senator Al well, Franken. might have some question. Oh, Senator Al Franken. Oh, yes. Was here. Oh, yes. Not here, but he was in San Francisco. And afterwards, he said he would sign copies of his book. And he said, I won't make it personal. I'll just sign my name, but... I will give you fleeting but meaningful eye contact. <laughs> so, Bob will have some energy to give you some eye contact one-on-one -on -one relative to each other um, out there. But quickly to thank especially Peter Clark and Susan who... Thank you, Susan and Peggy. Well, All of the spiritual thank care you for people. Your great introduction. You must be the dean or something. Thank you. She's very wonderful. Sweet. Thank you. Very nice. Now, I like be to thank. I like. I know it's completely out of place. I like to thank Richard Blum, who is here. Oh, oh regent. Where is he? Oh, there. I like A to regent thank of our Blum. university. Oh, I mixed you up. I want to thank Richard Blum because. He's the one who made sure that the Dalai Lama was there at San Diego, I happen to know. I'm sure of it. And, you know, the Chinese were freaking out. Oh, he shouldn't know. He can't address students. He might, like, he might show that there's such a thing as a real Tibetan. And so, but Richard did it, and I want to thank him for that. Richard. And thank you. Thank you for that. And he is, he's been a dear friend of the Dalai Lama for 30, 40 years. And your work yeah. with the American Himalaya Foundation has been extraordinary and wonderful, and you've done fabulous Fabulous work. And Mike Rabo and Nancy Lopez are the co-directors of the Symptom Management Service, outpatient palliative care that we have here at UCSF. That For 11 years, I have had a chance to come most Wednesday mornings to hear the attending physicians and fellows and nurses and social workers and nutritionists and hospice workers talking about people who've died. And to me, the palliative care community, people working in oncology are my heroes, my personal heroes. And I have uh, one more, I have 
I, I'd like we to have, thank you uh, for organizing this. Uh, yeah. Thank and, you. And I'd like to th Isa. And I'd like to thank Isa for, organizing for helping this. so much on this. And I'd like to thank Eve. Eve, mm -hmm. what do you got there? Oh, you got the color. It was, uh, oh, beautiful Egyptian. And I, I just Eve. need to mention our co-sponsors, which were, to meet we Dalai have Lama. the San Francisco Zen Center, <laughs> who've supported me in doing these things. We have Zen, hold your applause till the end, like the, uh, uh, anyway, Zen Hospice Project. Yeah, okay. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll never go to sleep if I can't just mention Tibet House is one of our co-sponsors tonight. Oh, thank you. The Foundation for the Sacred Stream, which is Laura Chandler's and Issa's place in Berkeley, beautiful place. The Bayview Zendo, Trout Black, it's a brand new Zen community in San Rafael. Um, uh, Kunde Tibetan Wellness Center, uh, Daly City or South San Francisco is thank you. Thank you. And uh, I also wanted to, I've got a big announcement in just a second if I can read my handwriting. I also wanted to thank Jim Prost Associates who put that uh, PowerPoint together earlier this evening. The Ketamine Research Associates, um, Ketamine Research Foundation which has just started and is running in San Rafael and in the forefront of the psychedelic work that we touched on earlier. And finally, if I look about, I think you're about 350 of you. And then I think, how many of you interacted in a caring, loving, healing way today with so many other people? It's really and that's impressive. pretty powerful, good feeling. I want to finish it up with telling you that by coming here tonight, you've contributed money that's going to the International Rescue Committee. And there are terrible things going on in Burma with the Rohingya people. Bad and words. there are terrible things going around the world. And the International Rescue Committee has been the one to really reach out and help the most difficult circumstances that people can find themselves in. And due to the George Sarlo Foundation, he's matched all of the net profit that we had here. So we'll be sending somewhere about $8,000 from tonight, from your contribution, to help out Great. people. So let's thank all of us. That's great. How In Tibetan, how do you say... Thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening, but come and see me and buy a book. And what's the last part? And come buy a book? Oh, in the tap the chick neurona. Yang Jong, did we get it right? We got it right. Thank you all for a wonderful evening. Okay.